I think I will start. Um, colleagues, uh, it, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome Dr. Marshall Chin uh, as our speaker today in the series on ethics in the COVID-19 pandemic, medical, social, and political issues. As you can see from the slide, uh, Professor Chin is the Richard Perillo Family Professor of Healthcare Ethics, as well as the Associate Director of the McLean Center and a senior faculty scholar at the Buxbaum Institute. Um, uh, Marshall Chin, a practicing general internist and health service researcher, has dedicated his career to reducing healthcare disparities through interventions at individual, organizational, community, and policy levels. Dr. Chin has elucidated practical approaches to improving the care of diverse individual patients and addressing systemic structural drivers of disparities in the healthcare system. Through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's program, Advancing Health Equity, which Professor Chin co-directs, um, he collaborates with teams of state Medicaid agencies, Medicaid managed, Medicaid managed care organizations, and frontline healthcare organizations to implement payment reforms to support and incentivize care transformations that advance health equity. Marshall Chin also partners with eight urban and rural communities to integrate medical and social care to reduce diabetes disparities through the Merck Foundation Bridging the Gap program. Dr. Chin evaluates the uh, importance of the federally qualified healthcare centers, uh, improves diabetes outcomes on the Chicago South Side through healthcare and community interventions, and improves shared decision-making among clinicians and LGBTQ persons of color. Marshall also applies ethical principles to reforms that reduce health disparities, discussions about a culture of equity, and what it means for health professionals to both care and advocate for their patients. Dr. Chin's most recent project uses improvisation and stand-up comedy, storytelling, and theater to improve the training of students in caring for diverse patients and engaging in constructive discussions around systemic racism and social privilege. This, this has been well published by Marshall and the Buxbaum Institute um, has joined, we hope, um, other institutes in, in supporting this program of improvisation and comedy and storytelling. Dr. Chin and his team created the Roadmap to Reduce Disparities cited in Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services reports. Um, Marshall is a member of the National Advisory Council of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, and is a former president of the Society of General Internal Medicine. A graduate of Harvard College and the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, Marshall completed his residency and fellowship um, in general medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard. He's received mentoring awards from the Society of General Internal Medicine, the University of Chicago, and was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2017, and currently is a member of the National Academy of Medicine's Committee on the Future of Nursing from 2020 to 2030. Today, as you can see from the slide, Marshall will be speaking on COVID-19 inequities, a culture of equity, and healthcare policy reforms. It's a great honor to welcome Marshall to our program and, and as our speaker today. Dr. Chin, please. Thank you very much, Mark. 
So I have an ambitious agenda for us over the next 60 to 90 minutes, 60 minutes of uh, roughly the lecture and then 30 minutes for discussion and question and answers. Three main learning objectives. First, to identify equity concerns with general COVID-19 health system funding. This is separate from targeted specific COVID-19 funding. So for example, we've had talks in the series about vaccination and funding for vaccination. I will not cover that since other speakers have done such a great job with those specific topics. The general COVID-19 funding refers to general federal government funding provided to the healthcare system during this period of COVID-19 in the context of COVID-19. And we'll see that there are major equity issues that have been raised by this type of funding. I'll segue then to the second learning objective, discussing then principles of fundamental policy reforms to advance health equity. So if we wanna move beyond a problematic system that leads to these types of inequities in COVID-19 health policy, how do we move beyond that with general principles? And then third, I will highlight the importance of creating a culture of equity to implement policy reforms and transform systems. I think if I gave this talk about a year ago, I would be heavy on more of the technical aspects in terms of uh, policies and levers and, and the process of change. I think I've learned uh, uh, over time and even more so over the past year that having a, what I would call a culture of equity is equally important as to the technical aspects and one without the other just won't work. So in other words, we could have a culture of equity, but we won't go very far unless we develop specific reforms with payment and with care transformation. Similarly, we have, may have policies regarding payment and quality improvement to advance health equity, but if we don't truly have a culture of equity in practice, we're gonna have limited success implementing those technical solutions. Here's the agenda. I'm gonna first give a, a example of a cultural and structural problem that has received a, a lot of attention in the past two weeks. Second, I'll then segue into in some ways a, a preview of the take home message, an overview of the conceptual model for advancing health equity. Third, I'll talk about then the COVID specific policy. So COVID-19 CARES Act Provider Relief Fund. I'll then go into more detail regarding these principles for advancing health equity, really focusing upon culture and a roadmap to advance health equity. And then I'll end with a, a discussion trying to place all of these discussions within the context of the current partisan divide we see in our country and populations living in alternative reality. So how do we, we deal with our current context given these major problems with inequities? And my talk is based upon my own research. So Mark mentioned a variety of research which ranges from patient studies to policy studies. And then, disparities intervention literature. We are now in year eight of the University of Chicago's equity initiative. And so we've learned a lot. We have a long way to go, but we've learned a lot at the same time regarding uh, practical on the ground lessons. And then uh, I am involved in a lot of meetings uh, nationally and committees regarding equity. So I have a fairly good pulse in terms of um, the national discussion. And here are the take home messages. First, we need to be intentional about advancing health equity. Second, strongly advocate using a roadmap to advance health equity, which emphasizes a culture of equity, as well as discrete systematic processes for care transformation and payment. And then we need to be flexible amidst the reality, flexible for opportunities, both in the short term and the long term. The other thing I'll try to do is really take the all of you to what I consider to be the, the, the forefront of the equities issues that uh, I've used this, this lecture to, to try to assemble thoughts of like where I think that the, the current big issues are and some thoughts about how we may approach them. And one of the big ones that I think we're all aware of is that we've had a, a rise in public attention and recognition of, of systemic racism over the past year. Uh, COVID-19, police brutality, uh, increased importance and in, in recognition of systemic racism. And it's starting to come out now in a variety of institutions the Commonwealth Fund just came up with a, a new initiative that's goal is to dismantle systemic racism in healthcare policy and practice. The CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Rich Besser, he had a recent uh, uh, statement that says that dismantling structural racism must become America's ultimate public health intervention. 
the National Institutes of Minority Health and Health Disparities with the NIH, uh, at the fall of 2020, they approved a structural racism research concept. And these research concepts become the basis then for eventual call for proposals and uh, requests for applications. And with a Biden administration, I anticipate that we'll start seeing NIH coming up with structural racism RFAs probably over the next year or so. So here's the, the initial example. So JAMA has a podcast series and at the end of February, they came up with a 16 minute podcast on structural racism. And here's the accompanying tweet from JAMA, which, which advertises the podcast. No physician is racist. So how can there be structural racism in healthcare? An explanation of the idea by doctors for doctors in this user-friendly podcast from the great Dr. Mitch Katz, who is the CEO of the New York City Health and Hospitals uh, uh, System uh, Corporation, basically the, the group that runs New York City's public health system, and uh, Dr. Ed Livingston, who was one of the JAMA editors. And uh, I think that Dr. Katz and Dr. Livingston are well-intentioned and they really do care about reducing inequities. What has happened though, is that this particular tweet and some elements of the podcast have been painful for many and they convey and exemplify some of the major problems that anyone that's trying to advance health equity will need to address in their solutions. So I'd like, in terms of this example, the focus to be more on the objective issues raised by the example that then become factors that must be addressed in any, for any solution to reduce inequities to work. So uh, this was billed as like structural racism for skeptics. And in the preamble to the interview in the podcast, Dr. Livingston said that given that racism is illegal, how can it be so embedded in society that it's considered structural? As a child of the 60s, I didn't get it. I don't feel I'm a racist. I grew up in a family where racism was reviled. So I grew up kind of anti-racist. to Just never ever even think of a person's race or ethnicity when you're evaluating them. Yet I think I'm being told I'm a racist in the modern era because of this whole thing about structural racism. Dr. Katz responded, you are not a racist. And also we are not going to end structural racism by focusing on individual people's attitudes. We're going to end structural racism by changing policies that keep people down. I think one of the mistakes good people make is thinking that we need to tell people how to think. That is not going to succeed. You cannot tell people how to think. What you can create Yes, Dr. Livingston then stated, personally, I think taking racism out of the conversation would help. Many people like myself are offended by the implication that we are somehow racist. When many of us grew up in an era where there had been racism and much progress had been made in ameliorating racism via dramatic legislation that was passed in the 1960s. So over the past two weeks, Twitter blew up and there was a lot of pushback against the, the tweet and elements of the podcast. And the response from uh, AMA and JAMA was fast. Here's the CEO, James Madeira, formerly of the University of Chicago. The AMA's House of Delegates passed policy stating that racism is structural, systemic, cultural, and interpersonal. And we are deeply disturbed and angered by a recent JAMA podcast that questioned the existence of structural racism and the affiliated tweet that promoted the podcast and stated, no physician is racist. So how can there be structural racism in healthcare? Dr. Madeira continues, JAMA has editorial independence from AMA, but this tweet and podcast are inconsistent with the policies and views of AMA. And I'm concerned about and acknowledge the harms they have caused. Structural racism in healthcare in our society exists and is incumbent on all of us to fix it. JAMA Editor-in-Chief Howard Bachner, MD. The language of the tweet, as well as portions of the podcast, do not reflect my commitment as an editorial leader of JAMA and JAMA Network 
to call out and discuss the adverse effects of injustice, inequity, and racism in medicine and society, as JAMA has done for many years. I take responsibility for these lapses and sincerely apologize for both the lapses and the harm caused by both the tweet and some aspects of the podcast. JAMA will schedule a podcast in the future to further discuss issues of structural racism and health and to address concerns raised about the podcast. So recently, AMA hired a chief equity officer, Dr. Aletha Maybank. So she sent out a series of tweets. The podcast slash tweet are, were wrong, absolutely appalling. And at its very core is a demonstration of structural and institutional racism. I am furious. It's harmful for everyone in the field of medicine and even more so for my black, indigenous, Latinx, Asian, and other historically marginalized colleagues, friends, and families. It is harmful for my team and all the other folks within the AMA who have been fighting hard and daily against racism and white supremacy to change culture, structures, and norms. I knew full well that coming to this space to lead this work was in no way going to be easy, just only necessary. I am clear this impacts the credibility of the AMA and the Center for Health Equity. Please know I am not silent ever. We all deserve better and way more than pulling of a tweet. I deeply appreciate and acknowledge the ongoing accountability provided by many of you over the last 24 hours and over the years towards AMA and JAMA. Please keep it up. I hear, see, and feel you. A few days later, uh, there's a, a press release statement by uh, Mitch Katz, Dr. Katz on March 4th. Systemic interpersonal racism both still exists in our country. They must be rooted out. I do not share the Gemma host belief doing away with the word racism will help us be more successful in inequities that exist across racial and ethnic lines. Further, I believe that we will only produce an equitable society when social and political structures do not continue to produce and perpetuate disparate results based on social race and ethnicity. Therefore, I firmly believe that both interpersonal and structural racism still exists in our country, and it is woefully naive to say that no physician is a racist just because the Civil Rights Act of 1964 forbade it. So there's a lot to digest in these statements in this uh, dialogue back and forth. And we'll have uh, time during the question and answers and discussion to, to dive into more depth. Throughout my talk, I'll refer back to different parts of these uh, statements uh, because I, again, I think they they crystallize some of the key challenges and barriers that solutions will need to address to work in today's real world. This is the slide the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uses to demonstrate the difference between equality, where everyone gets the exact same bite versus equity, people get the bite that fits them. Many of you have seen this slide, which shows a, a similar idea that uh, equality, one box, equity, you, you give the, the, the men the size boxes they need to the game. The reality is some people are born to privilege. Uh, slide, if you remove the fence, which is designed to represent structural barriers, structural inequity, structural racism, then you have uh, that, that barrier removed. So here's the part where I give you like in some ways the take home message up front. Uh, back at the end of 2020, I was invited by BMJ Quality and Safety to write an editorial. It really was a chance to, for the patient safety world to give a, a quick sort of, here's the state of the art regarding what we know about reducing disparities, advancing health equity. So if you start at the very top, the really core to everything really is to commit to the mission of advancing health equity and then being intentional about it, that we have to be intentional about advancing health equity. You see this then this uh, split. So this is the creation of the culture of equity. It's involving both understanding personal biases. And so why I would argue that probably all of us are uh, have implicit uh, racial biases, as well as then for our organizations, identifying the systemic structures and biases that can then uh, discriminate against and oppress marginalized populations. Now I gave this example of JAMA. But you know, my guess is that most, if not all, of the organizations that we're part of, you know, we have it also. So you know, it's not just JAMA. Um, on the right, you have the implementing the roadmap to reduce disparities, identifying the disparities, doing a root cause analysis of why the disparities exist, designing and implementing cure interventions. 
you see in between is where the rubber hits the road that every worker, whether they're the front line, whether the CEO, they know how to operationalize advancing health equity in their daily jobs. On the right, you have some of the big sort of policy issues, payment reform that supports and incentivizes care transformation that advances health equity, and then cross-sectoral partnerships to address medical and social drivers of health, both individual drivers and structural drivers. The bottom improving individual and population health, ultimately also, also improving uh, health and healthcare equity. So that's uh, my attempt on one slide to basically summarize uh, really the key aspects of advancing health equity. So um, Mark, you've organized a great seminar series. It's really been sort of a wonderful set of lecturers and, and experts and discussions. And uh, there's been a lot of discussion about COVID-19 racial ethnic disparities. And I'm just gonna summarize that from the talks, we know that uh, there are higher comorbidities, which I think minorities, higher exposures from essential work, crowded housing, vaccine hesitancy issues and mistrust from discrimination, access barriers such as transportation or access to employer-based health insurance. And uh, I put up here just to represent um, uh, Monica and Govin, um, this, uh, their, their talks and Govin's talk from last uh, week was a great example where again and again, Govin mentioned the actual policies for vaccine, vaccine distribution do not intentionally uh, advance health equity. They were intentionally designed to advance health equity, example after example, state after state. It's a common theme. So let's go down to like a, the, the, the COVID-19 specific part of my talk. And this is the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund. On the right there, that's one of my colleagues, Colin Grogan from the School of Social Service Administration, professor there, who's one of the national leaders in this particular area. And um, I'm gonna give like general principles and I'm gonna refer you to three of Colleen's uh, works for a deeper dive of the issues. One is on the left, she has a paper in press at the Journal of Health Politics, Policy and Law, empirical piece that uh, shows data regarding the inequities that I'll be talking about. Uh, it also goes into great detail regarding some of the financing mechanisms for hospitals. Uh, so it's a great read in terms of like uh, uh, getting inside the black box. On the right, she has, uh, it's already out there now in press or it's actually you know, online, uh, a editorial in the American Journal of Public Health on these issues of health equity and this provider relief fund. And back in the fall, she had a, a lecture on, on these issues. Um, so now on YouTube. Uh, you can search on the School of Social Service Administration website, Michael Davis Lecture. So thank you, uh, Colleen, for your leadership in this area. So I got involved in the, the spring of 2020. I got an email from a, a reporter from Newsweek asking me to comment upon the legislation that was being passed uh, to respond to uh, health care systems, uh, financial predicament because of COVID-19. And so this is the quote they picked from our, our uh, interview. Dr. Marshall Chen, Professor of Health Care Ethics at the University of Chicago, Harvard Medicine, told Newsweek that CMSs, so Medicare, Medicaid's formulas, appear to be designed to ensure that hospitals and large healthcare systems can maintain their bottom lines rather than guarantee that the facilities on which vulnerable Americans depend can keep their doors open. Uh, the statement holds in terms of what was happening at that particular time. I would say that uh, as uh, the program went on during the course of 2020, it was more the And so a little context, so spring of 2020, there was great economic hardship. Uh, 42 hospitals closing, mostly rural hospitals. March 2020, 42,000 healthcare workers lose their jobs. April, one month later, one point. 4 million healthcare workers lose their jobs. So a major problem. And uh, we know like hospitals, so University of Chicago, for example, one of the big issues is this, that we lost elective procedures, no elective procedures. And for a privately insured population, it's a lot of elective procedures that bring in a lot of the money. So hospitals lose money that way. Safe in hospitals, they were taking care of a disproportionate number of COVID-19 patients. There was the cost then of the equipment supplies for COVID, and then labor costs went up during this time as there was more demand for a limited supply of, of labor to care for patients and COVID patients. So financial crunch. Federal government passes the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund, whose purpose was designed to provide an influx of money to hospitals and other healthcare entities to help them respond to the pandemic. Congress said that funds could be used to offset costs related to treating COVID patients or to reimburse for lost revenue. So that was the, the first initial intent. 
Uh, so there was in the general distribution of funds, uh, uh, phases one, two, three. So phase one was the biggest phase, $50 billion. So April, <clears throat> right around that time of turbulence with a lot of the job loss, $30 billion in grants was distributed to eligible hospitals, physician practices, and other providers in proportion to their Medicare fee-for-service billings in 2019. So based upon Medicare, 65 and older population. <clears throat> Also in April, $20 billion was allocated to nearly 15,000 providers based on their share of net patient revenue. Net patient revenue, that's all patient revenue. Not necessarily like vulnerable populations, at-risk populations, but net patient revenue. So you see then that these, these, the regulations prioritize revenues lost over COVID need. So net patient revenue, Medicare fee-for-service billings. So you've probably been sort of connecting the dots, uh, the problem here. So this is the New York Times headline from July, I guess actually May, so May, May 25th. The headline is wealthiest hospitals got billions in this bailout for struggling health providers. 20 large chains received more than $5 billion in federal grants, even while sitting on more than $100 billion in cash. So no, the funding criteria weren't based upon need, not cure of the uninsured, not Medicaid, not the Medicare Advantage Program for Managed Care, not children's hospitals, no accounting for existing money and resources, my financial resources. So if you had, for example, a lot of money in the bank that wasn't accounted for. May, Kaiser Family Foundation study they, they, of uh, empirical data, they conclude hospitals with the lowest share of private insurance revenue receive less than half as much funding for each hospital bed compared to the hospitals with the greatest share of revenue from private insurance. Hospitals with more market power can command higher reimbursement rates from private insurers. They have more patients for private insurance, they can charge relatively high rates. So you start seeing this issue of like, um, the system rewards those with power in the system. And if the system is not set up to advance health equity, then you got problems. The de facto result was that wealthy hospitals with private insurance patients were prioritized over safe net hospitals with uninsured and public insurance patients. So de facto, hospitals with white patients were prioritized over hospitals with black and brown patients. So one of the possible reasons why prioritized revenue lost uh, was the, the, uh, the big priority over COVID need. Well, one issue was speed. Uh, both in terms of saving system and getting the money out. So Seema Verma, who had uh, Medicare at that time, said the first priority is we want to get this money out fast. Using Medicare, based on the systems uh, that were used to distribute Medicare money, using Medicare was the fastest. We are in the data sets and data systems. Also then, of course, there were powerful stakeholders that benefited from this plan and, and the hospital lobbying groups were very active during this period. And another possibility is that equity was not a priority. So I'm gonna sort of have a digression here of uh, this issue like being flexible and the question of fundamental reform versus seize the opportunity. The, the take home message being that um, advancing health equity is not necessarily a linear process and go where there are opportunities. You're gonna see as we get into the meat of like my principles for advancing health equity, many Uh, however, there are opportunities which are a shorter term to then uh, advance equity. And I'll give you an example. Uh, right around that time, I guess it's the springtime era, I was, I was uh, involved in a number of calls with some of the consumer and patient advocacy groups. And they were trying to determine, well, you know, we know that the, the regulations are being written for, for these legislation. What are we trying to put onto the plate to try to get it into regulation uh, so that then more money would flow uh, towards uh, the providers, institutions that care for these at-risk populations. And so I would say that none of the suggestions dealt with fundamental reform. Uh, and the reason why is that that was not gonna be part of the regulations, that it had to be things that could be weaved into, into a, a regulation and rulemaking quickly. And that meant that could be built into existing programs. So almost all the suggestions were more money for existing programs. Um, that, imperfect as they were. Phase two and phase three, smaller amounts than the 50 billion, expand to Medicaid uh, uh, provi providers, Medicaid managed care, as well as still the Medicare. Uh, 
And then over time, uh, later than the spring period, there was target distribution to try to work on equity issues. You notice these are all smaller numbers from the general funding that tried to then look at the hotspot COVID, the need areas, rural sites, safety net providers, tribal uh, facilities, for example. So it helped over time, uh, not to the same extent as the magnitude of the, uh, the general funding. So I'm not gonna to go to the, the part where I, I go into more details with some of these principles for advancing health equity. And so you see, again, this, this major problem with the way that the COVID money was uh, distributed, largely because um, of the way the current system is set up and then that equity was just not enough of a priority. So I'm gonna really focus mostly on the middle part of the diagram, the, the, both the cultural equity part and then the implementing roadmap part. And so here are the five lessons I give when I give a, uh, my, my uh, sort of standard talk on advanced health equity. There's no magic bullet solution. Achieving equity is a process. And what we'll focus on uh, for this talk is the culture and roadmap for technical processes. We need to address social determinants. We need, we need to address the payment incentives. And then um, you know, interestingly, like and this is the purpose of the, of the uh, McLean Center, but I think too few times clinicians and healthcare folks do not frame equity as a moral and social justice issue. I'm not quite sure why we talk about during discussions, uh, but we, we need to do better at that in terms of um, this framing. So I think one big problem is what I call magical thinking. I can't tell you how many times when I talk to various healthcare leaders about investment equity, and they say, basically, don't worry, we got it covered. And they basically give one of the, a variation of one of the three uh, statements here. We're already doing quality improvement. We're a safe net organization. It's who we are. The shift from fee-for-service payment, the value-based payment, and alternative payment models will fix things. So this is the assumption that these things inherently will lead to the addressing of inequity. The problem is that's not how the invisible hand works. So basically you assume that the invisible hand of uh, alternative payment models or the invisible hand of back, back being a safe net provider or the invisible hand of Adam Smith, the free market will naturally lead to a good result. Uh, she has this cartoon from the daily cost where the tears from the invisible hand are drowning uh, the little man down there. Uh, this is a variant of like a rising tide does not necessarily lift all boats. So a, a one size fits all solution doesn't really work as well for equity. And, and there can be negative unintended consequences. So like the, the most common one, one of the most common ones is that it's oftentimes easier to uh, basically cherry pick uh, healthy patients and erect barriers to um, at-risk populations. So for example, um, creating rules where you uh, prevent your clinic from seeing Medicaid patients, that's often an easier fix than trying to um, improve the care and outcomes of at-risk patients unless there's more intentionality with the rules and incentive systems. So Mark mentioned this Robert Wood Johnson Foundation program, uh, where again, we're working with seven teams. A team consists of a state Medicaid agency, a Medicaid managed care organization, and a frontline healthcare organizations. And um, the magic sauce we're trying for is payment reform that supports and incentivizes care transformation advances health equity. So no, it's not payment reform for payment reform's sake, but payment reform that supports and incentivizes these care delivery transformations that can advance health equity. So now I'm gonna do a quick view overview of some of the technical aspects of the roadmap. Um, it's identifying disparities. I'll spend more time on root cause analysis. Analysis. So here's a common mistake that people will, when they're looking, we'll try to figure out what, why do we have disparities? They basically don't do the work of like involving patients and communities in the discussions and solutions. And there's no substitute for talking with the affected patients and communities. So let me share an example with you. Um, one of our early grantees was a Medicaid health plan in the state of Rhode Island. And they saw that uh, their Hispanic patients had worse depression outcomes than their white patients. And so uh, they decided to, to get together for a focus group of their uh, Latinx providers. So their Latinx doctors, nurses, social workers, educators, and asked them, why are there these depression disparities? And the Latinx provider said, well, you know, we think it's for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, uh, there basically are transportation issues and, and, and things like the child care at home. And so that it's really hard for some of the Hispanic patient population to come in to visits. And so if we do a telephone intervention, that's going to be great because it's convenient. We don't have the transportation issues, the child care issues. This is the solution. 
Uh, Sound great in theory. Um, they rolled out the intervention and they found that the huge health plan, they had trouble enrolling more than 12 patients. And in retrospect, um, the reasons were obvious. It turns out that um, most of their patients had cell phones, but they had the pay by the minute cell phone plans as opposed to probably most people on this webinar have the unlimited um, plan, uh, minute plans. So it would be very expensive rapidly if you were doing a telephone intervention that you were paying by the minute. Then also at the time, the, the, the governor of uh, the, the state was starting to do a uh, crackdown on uh, immigrant workers. So it's not a good uh, timing at all. So my guess is that if the, instead the, the, uh, the health plan had done a focus group of 12 Hispanic patients, um, my guess is they would have found this and saved a lot of time and effort in designing a better intervention. Um, there's not a lot of themes about what works to uh, reduce uh, disparities. The best we've come up with uh, reviewing like over 400 interventions was multifactorial interventions that attack different levers, culturally tailored approaches better than generic, team-based care, often really a strong role for nurses, evolving families and community partners, robust literature on community health workers, patient navigators, lay health workers, interactive skills-based trainings, what we'll do in, 30, in 20 minutes when we do the discussion as opposed to what I'm doing now, lecturing. Um, and just a reminder on this slide that um, on the left, you have a person who lives in a community. If they have access to care, they become a patient interacting with a provider, a health organization. Above that, you have policy where money is the big hammer. So you can have interventions at any of these different levels, at any of these different sort of uh, loci. Um, we sort of already talked about this in terms of like social needs, both individual and online social drivers. Um, this is a cool diagram by uh, Kostucci and Auerbach. Uh, sometimes you hear this upstream, downstream terminology. Downstream is our healthcare workers, what we do in terms of, you know, what's pretty far downstream. Upstream is, for example, uh, addressing underlying poverty or underlying problems in the educational system. And in, as an example, so, uh, you know, Monica Peek and I, we co direct this um, Merck Foundation Bridge the Gap uh, program. So we've done like a, a couple site visits to La Clinica, which is a fairly qualified health center in Washington, D.C., that serves uh, a mostly El Salvadoran uh, immigrant population. And they are truly a committed organization, socially justice oriented, that they, they do it right in terms of addressing the whole patient um, and social factors. And many of the patients have a variety of legal issues. So one example is they partner with a, a legal partnership uh, agency literally two blocks away. And as one example, they have um, case rounds, legal, medical legal case rounds, where they will bring together medical and legal staff and talk about the, a variety of the patients and clients and jointly discuss then the medical and legal issues, basically coordinating care. And the sad thing is that um, there is currently little funding stream for the social a part of this. So they are a grant making machine that um, healthcare system pays for the health part. And then they are grant making machine in terms of grants that apply, uh, pay for addressing social terms of health. Uh, so payment here. So goals here really are explicitly designing quality of care and payment policies to achieve equity, holding the healthcare system accountable through public monitoring, evaluation, and supporting with adequate resources. So I'm going to stick at the level of principles because you're going to hear about this again and again in the literature and the papers as this becomes more prominent. So I basically want to give you sort of a primer so that when you do come across more detailed descriptions, uh, you have a foundation for your further um, uh, learning and, 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 and um, uh, application. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to find value-based payment as those payment systems are designed to reward high quality care and health outcomes. promote value and cost efficiency. They frequently incorporate value-based payment principles. At present, many still use fee-for-service inside as the internal chassis to distribute resources. These could provide effective mechanisms and incentives to fund infrastructure to address social terms of health and advance health equity, i.e. the La Clinica problem. So this is maybe the key slide here. You might think about payment in terms of upfront payment and retrospective payment. Upfront payment or prospective payment could cover infrastructure and workforce for interventions. So for example, fee-for-service generally does not cover for community health workers. You could use upfront funding to, get, to pay for community health workers or team-based care. So it's an issue for University of Chicago. How do you fund team-based care? Or for example, to change the information technology system to track equity. Retrospective payment, you could use retrospective payment to reward, incentivize, reducing disparities, and best health equity. So those organizations that have done well with reducing disparities, give them more money. Um, 
We've talked a lot about this already. Uh, I'll slip to the bottom here. So one example, especially for like our surgical and um, uh, OBGYN colleagues, a hybrid of upfront and retrospective value-based payment would be, an example would be a maternity bundled payment that covers prenatal care, the cost of delivery, postnatal care, that also includes a quality withheld for a healthy birth weight baby, even additional money if they have a, a good health outcome. That's you know, a way of getting of come out of it all. And then again, keep staying the little principles. When you're reading these talk, or these uh, plans and about payment, you might ask these questions. What is being incentivized or what is that financial risk? Some systems, for example, just incentivize outpatient care, inpatient care, or total cost of care, very different incentives. What is the magnitude of the incentive or the amount of money at risk? What patients or populations are you responsible for? What are the data analytic paid lists you have or don't have to be able to do the analytical work for this? If you have savings, do you have to meet certain quality metrics to get that savings? What are the appropriate payment targets to advance equity? Is it attaining an absolute level of quality? Is it relative attainment compared to a benchmark? Is it improvement? So you may be starting at a low level, but you improve, you get paid. Should you reward, incentivize paying for reduced disparities or relative combinations of these? So again, general principles to keep in mind and refer to over time. So, you know, this is lesson two. So, you know, most of my talks, I usually give like the, the talk about like uh, the integration of equity and uh, culture and technical, but uh, it makes more sense to this talk to basically now come back to culture and start coming back to some of those JAMA examples and you now launch into our discussion. Um, so yeah, back to that uh, slide there. And so many of you heard the, the famous quote from Peter Drucker, businessman, culture each strategy for breakfast. His point being that uh, it's experienced in the business world where you could have wonderful business tactics, wonderful business strategies, but if it doesn't fit the cultural organization, it's not gonna happen or it's not gonna happen well. So here's one of the, the, the money slides here. The, why is the cultural equity so important? Why, why am I spending so much time on this talk compared to like a year ago? Well, I've come to the realization that effective equity invent, interventions won't occur or be sustained unless equity is truly prioritized in an organization. I think like, so academics here, you can do a, a one-off. So you may get funded to do an equity intervention. You can get buy-in in the little the neck of the woods or whatever your project is. But if the wider organization isn't behind it, there's a high chance that it won't be sustained and that it will basically wither and die after the grant money goes away. Um, the other sort of recognition here, and it gets in the second one, that buy-in across the organization won't occur unless equity is understood, valued, and prioritized both individual behavior of the organization and then organizational structures. So one of the things that I, I came to realize is that um, for sustainable change for that involves payment and quality and care transformation, it's the whole organization. You can't just work with the quality improvement folks or the payment folks or the equity folks. You got to involve, for example, IT. You got to involve patient experience. You got to involve the strategic uh, planning folks. You got to involve the front line of people. Um, it's everything. There's, there's no shortcut around it. Um, so, for example, like uh, we work with like state Medicaid agencies. You can't just work with like the equity division. You got to work with the the actuarial people. You got to work with the strategic planners here. You got to work with the IT division within the state Medicaid agency. It really is the whole shebang. Uh, and so this really got to be the buy-in across the whole organization. Um, and then, uh, and here's where it gets back to the John podcast. I've come to the conclusion that organizations won't address the key drivers unless the hard discussions occur. Well, many organizations won't address structural racism unless they've gone through the hard discussion which involves, you know, how are they defining racism? How are they defining equity? Um, the hard look in, internally in terms of individual biases, the hard look internally about, well, how have we structured certain things that are, you know, any place, including University of Chicago, that uh, basically are, are structurally racist uh, ways of setting things up. Um, do we really value health equity or are we giving lip service? Are we intentional? Is it part of our mission statement? Does the reward and incentive system, for example, for the senior leadership, is it built in that you they're rewarded for incentives for reducing equity or it reducing inequities? Uh, is it part of training the interpersonal and the structural? Um, I will skip the University of Chicago example. I want to leave more time for discussion and you've already heard my University of Chicago example uh, and other talks probably. I'm going to share the state Medicaid example. Um, Recently, so in the past month, 
Um, we had uh, two hours with the senior executive uh, leadership team of uh, one of the state Medicaid programs we're working with. So this is like their senior leadership. Um, and so they got a uh, version of this talk, cut down version, um, as well as the, the key part was probably like um, half the time in, in breakouts design, uh, organized by the way they're structured. The feedback we got was that um, it was a real eye opener that they hadn't quite thought of what it mean to apply an equity lens to unit X within the agency, for example. So this whole idea of like, what does it mean to apply an equity lens to the work? Um, then there's this issue of like, um, you know, every working worker knowing how to operationalize advanced health equity in their daily jobs. I've mentioned that. Um, I'll skip the universal health example. We'll come back to this during discussion, Monica. Um, I do want to uh, mention this, that um, if you haven't seen it, so Monica Peak Bella and I, uh, we had a paper come out at the end of 2020 in academic medicine. It was basically titled something like Practical Lessons About Teaching About Race and Racism. Um, I think it's one of the articles that we're, we're, we're proudest of in terms of like um, bringing together uh, some of our, our practical experience and, and what we've learned from others. Um, there are like 12 lessons. What I want to point out here is the upper right here, start with stories, not numbers. Start with stories, not numbers. The way Monica Picas said it is that when you start a lecture with numbers, it's almost giving people an excuse to tune out as opposed to starting with um, stories and examples. Uh, keep that in mind during the rest of my talk. So this issue about uh, fearless conversations. And so um, these are conversations about structural racism, colonialism, and social privilege. Um, one of the transformative events for me in the past decade was I spent a summer in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, working on a paper of what the two countries were doing to advance health equity. And on the slide here on my left, uh, these three co-authors are, are Maori, the indigenous peoples of, um, of uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so we had literally dozens of these hard conversations. And in fact, this phrase about free, frankless, free, frank, and fearless um, discussions comes from them. Uh, and then they, they put it in, you know, they really pushed for it to be in the article we wrote together. And I'm glad that um, it became part of that article. And, and what they basically explained to me during these dozens of difficult conversations is the lived experience of being Maori and how the rules and regulations uh, baked into the private and public sector in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, basically had put the Maori at a disadvantage. They were also the, the folks that introduced me to um, this concept of white fragility, and they introduced me to the work of Robin D'Angelo. You may remember this was a book that got a lot of press maybe about a year ago. A white fragility defined as racial stress that can lead to defensive emotions and behaviors in whites, such as anger, fear, guilt, argument, silence, withdrawal, or statements such as, you know, I find it offensive that someone would consider me to be a racist. And, and again, the way the Maori the colleagues described it to me was, uh, and this was quite impactful when they explained it to me, discomfort cannot be a reason to avoid dialogue, for then white fragility would in essence be a tool to perpetuate inequities in the power structure. So you say, oh, we can't discuss uh, uh, racism. Well, basically you're, you're basically then baking in the current system, which has then sort of these, these uh, structural racist aspects. I gave anesthesia grand rounds recently, and, and someone asked me, well, you know, are we particularly bad healthcare in terms of this racism? And I, uh, my answer was, well, you know, the sad story is that probably every other field is similarly bad. Um, and so uh, the football example, so there's something called the Rooney rule where um, Uh, I think minority coaching candidates. So uh, some of you may know the story. So Jacksonville Jaguars, they hired Urban Meyer to be their football coach recently. And one of the uh, key hires after that becomes the, the strength and conditioning coach, the guy who's going to basically get the team into shape. So um, the guy who was hired was a guy named Chris Doyle, who used to be the strength and conditioning coach at the University of Iowa. Uh, and he left Iowa because he had been um, accused of being uh, racist against the uh, African-American players as well as bullying the white players who had learning disabilities. Uh, and so uh, the first Pollard Alliance, which advocates for uh, fear hiring, the executive directors um, uh, had this quote, which um, says that um, this reflects the good old boy network that is precisely the reason why there's such a disparity in employment opportunities for black coaches. Um, there's a quote actually from Urban Meyer when there was pushback. He said, well, you know, 
I can vouch for Chris Doyle. He's an upstanding guy. You know, he's a man of the highest, uh, you know, uh, caliber. And I have no doubt that Chris Doyle, you know, treats Urban Meyer well, but that is not necessarily then the, the, the lived experience then, uh, for example, the University of Iowa uh, football players. Um, New York Times a month ago in Nashville, um, notorious for being um, very male dominated and uh, uh, white dominated. So Morgan Wallen is uh, one of the big stars now, and he was caught on video saying some racist uh, language. Uh, it's Nikki Guyton, who's the only African American woman hired to a, a signed to a major label. So she sort of tweeted out, you know, this is going to be the same thing where in the past the country music establishment uh, basically swept it on the rug. Um, and actually, there was pushback where uh, his songs were pulled from the radios for a while. He wasn't eligible for music awards, that type of thing. The New York Times um, editorial has quotes from a couple um, uh, women and uh, people of color who are in the country music business. We see Palmer. In the female experience, you understand what it is to be the underdog, to come into a situation that's mostly white male driven and try to assert yourself. And men of Shires, I assume a lot of males aren't speaking out because they're comfortable with their places of power and money. Why would they want to change? I'm going to skip these. So I'll prove that, well, you know, the US doesn't have a monopoly upon structural racism and colonialism. Um, and so the challenge is that power is the issue, it's control over resources like money, and it's control of the historical narrative, control over the framing of health inequity. And so that's one of the reasons I believe that like, um, let's say Dean Madeira, so the CEO uh, Madeira of, of AMA and the JAMA editor made the, and, and Aletha Maybank, Dr. Aletha Maybank made the points about being harmful because it, 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 it distracts from the historical narrative and the frame of, of health equity away from some of these true root drivers. Okay. I am gonna skip ahead to, I wanna skip ahead to a little bit of solutions. And you remember I, I shared that, um, that point, Monica's point about starting with stories, not data. And so Mark mentioned that over the past four years, I've started getting into improv and stand-up comedy. Um, and so in improv, the most famous principle is yes and. Agree with your team partners and build upon what they have said and give it to you. Listen, build positively off what your partner has said and eventually the scene will end up in a good place. Um, you know, Monica's terrific recent analyst article about um, counseling about COVID vaccinations, it really employs this yes and principle or the principles of motivational interviewing. And I think it's, it's uh, Mitch Cass's point that he said that, you know, it's very hard to basically tell someone they're racist and think that that's gonna be a solution. So I, I bet, for example, if we talked to Mitch longer, he would agree with this, that, um, it's important to have these conversations, you can't avoid them, but the way we do it has to be more sophisticated than, you know, simple, here's the facts, ma'am, type of approach that we gotta start with where the, that person is and then try to move them in terms of uh, uh, understanding these issues of inequities and, and racism. Now stand up, it's a different, it's a different, different beast in some ways that like, um, um, this very different culture, improv and stand up. Uh, this picture has my, my stand-up mentor, Mona Abermishan, uh, after I'd done my longest set, which is a 15-minute set at this Comedy Bowl tonight. And Mona has taught me um, this concept of the power stand-up has of saying no to the absurdity and social injustice of biases, stereotyping, and racism. But basically, like in jokes that basically show how stupid and absurd uh, um, uh, stereotypes are, uh, it's a way to um, basically teach uh, in a hopefully approachable way. And so often in my sets, I talk a lot about identity and my Asian American background. Uh, one of the things we're taught as stand-ups is to, to try to make it our own in terms of like drawing upon our own personal stories. And what can you say that no other stand-up can say? Uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, formed during this event. Um, and so we, we did our sets, uh, 10 minute sets each. And then um, we actually did a combed down version of what training we've done with the medical students, um, where we asked the alderman and the volunteer to basically describe how people perceive them when they meet them for the first time. What do the outside world get right and wrong about these perceptions? And so we actually, you know, actually got the alderman and uh, another community leader, uh, Timothy May, involved in a really cool discussion about uh, essentially structural racism and implicit biases, uh, which I thought was a, a fruitful conversation for all. Um, maybe I'll end here that um, um, I was invited to write this uh, uh, sort of review for the Journal of Clinical, uh, Journal of Clinical um, 
uh, endocrinology met met metabolism. And the revision is under review, but the way I end the paper is, I do not have an easy solution for how to bridge the partisan divide in worldviews and cultures. However, I believe that the public must perceive that policies and interventions are fair and benefit them. And a crucial initial step is effective communication that encompasses intense listening, active engagement, yes and ways of acknowledging the patient's starting point on the way to an aspirational goal, true respect and curiosity to understand the lived experience, and a belief that the vast majority of people are inherently good, and that we must appeal to people's inner moral sense and yearning for justice and human rights. So I will end there, and uh, Monica, uh, why don't you take it away in terms of uh, Q&A? Excellent. Thank you so much, Marshall, for a fascinating um, and power-packed uh, lecture. You had a lot, a lot in there. Um, I'll, I'll take the, the prerogative by starting um, a question. Uh, you talked a lot about um, structural racism and interpersonal racism, um, the need for us thinking about both of those, for us thinking about um, the business case as well as the sort of interpersonal and moral case in moving things forward. Um, how um, do you suggest that we try to intertwine these simultaneously as we move forward? Yeah, it's a great question. So you remember that 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 slide, the conceptual framework slide, I flashed a couple of times. You know, so they have that that bar, um, and it's sort of an artificial division between the culture of equity, and then I, what I refer to as like some of these technical steps regarding things like payment or how we will re redesign the care system. I think they need to go hand in hand, that, that one without the other um, isn't gonna work. And the reality is they all take time. And so that, um, I think one of my slides, the Be Flexible slide mentioned that this is not a linear process. It's not like, well, you know, we do this, and then this, and then this, and then this. The reality is that um, it's gonna be uh, bouncing around a bit. Some is like um, where there is um, the opportunity, where it aligns with existing efforts, where there's someone that wants to be a champion to do that. Um, but um, what we've learned like in the past year uh, from some of our Robert Johnson work is that when we try to short circuit the process. So for example, if we don't spend as much time coaching teams about the cultural equity part in those hard conversations, or vice versa, if we just talk about cultural equity and we talk, don't talk about like the practical ways that you incorporate in daily job, it ain't gonna work. So, so a couple examples. Um, we're thinking about the future of our Robert Johnson donation program now, and we are explicitly gonna beef up the part about uh, how can we do better in terms of um, having the conversations about anti-racism and culture of equity. The University of Chicago experience, I would say uh, in the beginning, it was more the cultural equity piece. And the feedback we got at year four was that many of the front line thought it was great in terms of being uh, more aware, but they didn't know how to apply the lessons in like their daily job in IT or analytics or you know um, the front office staff and all. So they had to be combined. Great. Um, and what advice would you give, um, given the sort of socio-political climate that we're in right now, um, to the physicians, the researchers, all of us that are listening in the room, you, you led with the comments, um, the, the, the tweets, the podcast, um, this environment that we're in where many of us are working towards social justice. Um, and we're in the middle of a sea change and racial reckoning um, and trying to sort of push this work forward. At the same time, the very institutions that we're working in, uh, that we're publishing in, um, we're, you know, are also um, not insensitive to these very uh, issues of structural racism. Um, and how would you suggest trying to move forward? There's a little bit of an internet glitch and so that um, the part about structural racism at the end and um, the role of providers, I didn't quite hear what the question was. Well, just, just what are your suggestions as um, people are um, as clinicians and researchers and interventionists and policy makers are trying to make the world uh, a more racially just place and space um, for our patients, um, yet the uh, 
um, institutions in which we work, the places where we're trying to publish, um, all of the, the, the places where we're trying to affect change, all of them are coming under scrutiny right now um, for uh, structural issues and injustice around uh, race. And so do you, what advice do you have for uh, those of us on the front lines in many different arenas? Because um, you, you led your talk with the specific example of JAMA. Um, and many of us are trying to publish in JAMA. Um, and so um, what advice would you give? Yeah. Um, there's an improv, actually the standard principle of like, never sort of punch down. You can punch up, you can't punch down. And, and that's what I would say here that in our individual interaction with individual people, so like with our patients, with our colleagues, um, with other staff at the, at, at the medical center, for example, um, I like to try to have that yes and type of uh, way of approaching things. Uh, you know, what you again have beautifully described in, in your way of counseling, for example, patients that are uh, hesitant to take the vaccine or maybe skeptical and all. Uh, and so, um, that is not, you know, accusing someone of being racist and, and all. It's trying to start where they are, understand the perspective, and then essentially using these motivational interview techniques to try to change behavior over time. I think, like, when you're talking about power structures, and one of the slides I went, I, I, I went over because we didn't have time was um, this issue, like, when I, I point out, like, I, I don't tend to be a grab the bullhorn and march in the streets type of person. I tend to be working the system type of person. Um, but, you know, I, I recognize there are times it's important to have that bullhorn. And what the condition, some of the conditions are when, you know, there's a gross inequity, um, there's a big power differential between uh, the oppressor and the oppressed, uh, and there's little incentive um, by the powerful to change the system. So I would argue then that um, some of what you're talking about later in terms of like some of these structures and systems and policies, these are generally powerful organizations, powerful systems run by powerful people uh, with wealth um, that have um, little uh, incentive to change the current system. You know, the national example I gave in, in country music. So there, I think, is a really important role for, for those brave leaders, such as yourself, you've been one of the leaders, to say it like it is. I mean, you saw that the tone, for example, of, of Dr. Letha Maybank's tweets, you know, that's, that's you know, it's, it's vital to have uh, uh, leaders like that, 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 that do that. And I know that it's easier for someone like you or someone like Dr. Maybank as opposed to someone that's a fellow or like an assistant professor starting out to you know, challenge the, the, the um, JAMA or challenge the AMA. Um, but also too, we can work with the organizations and this power in organizations. Uh, so even like if, if you're like, you know, someone a junior as part of an organization, you know, um, this uh, clout. So, you know, as, as they say, and as you say, you know, Monica, you know, speaking truth to power, uh, there clearly is a role for that and, and an important role is, um, because, you know, that point about the, the JAMA uh, the podcast was that the sad reality is that um, there are, there are still are, are, are folks that, that, um, that um, need to continue to learn like the rest of us that, you know, we all have our biases and, and all that, and that structural issues do uh, influence uh, outcomes and equities for a lot of folks. There's just a, a quick follow-up from Dr. Vela, um, our colleague and friend who uh, asks, is there truly any credible excuse of educated academic physicians to deny the existence or magnitude of structural racism? So personally, you know, I, I don't think so. I mean, in terms of like, like uh, you know, it exists and then we need to sort of call it out. I think the, the point that Mitch Cash was raising is like, um, one of the most effective ways to do that. There are some audiences like, like in this case, like for example, JAMA, uh, AMA, you know, it, it, the organizational change in some of uh, the more conservative states or, 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 or organizations, um, calling it like it is probably is not gonna be as effective as some of the techniques that use, you know, yes ands and motivational interviewing staying true to the goal, you know, not sort of whitewashing a reality, um, but there are probably ways the message needs to be tailored, the communication needs to occur. Um, if our goal is to be effective as opposed to um, um, just making the statement uh, for a given organization. Uh, 
Um, this segues actually nicely into a question that we have um, from one of our medical students, uh, Natalia Kosla. She says, I spend a lot of time thinking about this tension between protecting the majority's comfort so that we at least get some momentum going among them versus just being honest. For example, the deep is a uh, deep. <laughs> My tongue is tripping over the word. Um, depoliticizing of the term social justice to instead quality improvement in medicine is common. When I have brought this up with faculty and administration, I understand that attention they struggle that they're struggling with is saying less controversial words to make the concept more palatable to older and more traditional people in charge. But I fear that this is also weakening our work and betraying its real purpose. How do we handle this balance? Yeah, that's a great question. And a shout out to Natalia that she and I are working on creating a sketch comedy class that um, it could be either for students or we may end up doing it with the uh, medical center staff and um, uh, faculty uh, where we we're trying to basically train folks in being able to write and then perform sketches and then lead a dialogue with the audience regarding these issues. You know, um, let me first say, I don't have all the answers in that, like, um, in some ways, I'm tapping into, like, um, a wider question. I think we face as a society regarding the alternative realities, uh, the partisanship. And so in some ways, the issues we're talking about are repeated in every field and across our wider society. And I think it's, it's an open question, you know, what are going to be the best ways to communicate? My own personal belief is uh, a variant on the answer I, I gave to Dr. Bella's question, Monica's question, um, that... Um, we have to maintain the true North stars. We can't whitewash. Uh, we need to tailor to the given audience. And again, this thing about punching up is okay. Wouldn't we'll, we'll punch down. Um, and then again, if our goal is to change minds, um, we have to think about, you know, what is a way to essentially motivation interview and yes, and in a way that doesn't sell out in terms of not being truthful, um, yet also, um, um, can get through to the given person. Uh, and that's attention. And, and, and I'm hoping like, like different things like the arts things we're doing with um, Buxbaum and um, Mark's, we did with the ethics fellows, we're doing with the students. Um, Brian Callen, who's, who's uh, the, the, the hosted maybe sessions, he's doing with uh, Shirlene Wobi with the graphic medicine. We're hoping that in some ways, when it becomes personal, you know, you have these discussions that are with lived experience especially with people you know and all, that becomes a more accessible experience as opposed to, I think, for example, we could talk to a monolithic institution, you're talking to like the monolithic JAMA, the monolithic AMA, you know, you're not offending a person, you're, you know, you're, you're speaking out against the institution, uh, which is different than like um, uh, the smaller the group or organization, then it gets more personal, so it gets trickier. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. And Mark, do you have any questions or comments or Brian that you want to ask for Dr. Chin? Yeah, one, one question I, I have, and, and maybe this is, is, is splitting hairs, but maybe there's actually a, sort of a practical reason for it in terms of how one responds, is that I, I, in one of the earlier slides you had mentioned, uh, you know, some of these organizations that are sort of taking on the, the problem of, of, of racism, and some of them use the term systemic, and some of them use the term structural. Is, is, is there a difference in between those in, in terms of how, how we may approach them or are they, are they pretty much synonymous? Well, that's a great question. You know, I, 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 my guess is that people would interpret them, um, uh, they mean different things to different people. And one last last two, I made this point about like, um, one of the challenges in this overall work is that when an organization starts having discussions, they gotta start at ground zero in terms of like, well, what do we mean by equity? What do I mean by disparity? What do I mean by racism? Um, let alone things like structural and systemic. And, and actually, I don't have a great answer for you yet, Brian. And it's probably you know lazy thinking on my part in terms of like um, um, not being precise regarding you know is there a difference between systemic and structural? Oh, you you broke up a little bit at at the end there. Oh, I was just saying like. Um, um, you know, part of this lazy thinking on my part that I haven't been precise about defining the difference between systemic and structural, and um, but clearly both are different than um, the answer of like, well, those are distinct from interpersonal biases, implicit biases. Let me throw it back to you. I'm actually curious what you and, and, and Monica, you know, how would you answer that question? <laughs> 
I, 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 I mean, I was trying to sort of think about it through through the course of your talk and wondering if if systemic is something that actually sort of incorporates the sort of cultural aspect, like like, like sort of creating a culture where is where structural is something where you can really look at at sort of the power structures and hierarchies. Maybe I I, I don't know. That's why I asked the question because I was I, I often sort of use them interchangeably, but but there may be some real differences in how to think about it. So I, I don't know if Monica as well has has something to offer. Yeah, um, the way that I think about it is that uh, structural racism um, is more about the policies, procedures, the rules, um, the laws, the things that codify um, inequities. Um, versus like Marshall was saying, interpersonal racism or internalized racism. When I think about the word systemic, um, to me that implies that it's everywhere <laughs> um, and that it may um, be just a reflection that it's um, like the analogy that um, Kamara Jones uses like carbon monoxide poison or radiation poison. You know, it's, it's slowly killing us all, particularly black and brown people. Um, but that it's everywhere um, and all forms of it are everywhere. Um, but I think that uh, all forms of racism are everywhere. It's, you know, racism is systemic, but there are different kinds of racism um, and that structural racism is, you know, more about the policies and procedures. So, so let me add another nuance. Your, 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 your answers made me think of something else too that uh, I didn't cover in, in the prepare talk. Um, you're increasingly seeing like um, these statements that it's not just what, it's not just like the end result, but sort of how we got there, or it's not just like um, what we're doing, but the process of what we're doing. And let me give you, and let, me, let me give a shout out to um, there are a couple of my colleagues, so Scott Cook and Yelena Todic. Um, they're two of the folks that have been heavily involved in the University of Chicago's Equity Initiative. And so they, they taught me about critical theory. Uh, and, and so this idea like um, um, how basically that there are various systems and this is where system and there are systems of oppression. Uh, and, and there are both sort of obvious and less obvious ways that uh, structures are built that can basically marginalize uh, different populations and discriminate and lead to inequities. Um, and so one of the examples is that like, um, who is at the table? How are people's input uh, brought in? Uh, what is that, that that dialogue? And so, you know, a concrete example is that, um, you know, like from the quality improvement field and totally quality management, whole idea about like um, sort of trying to um, level out vertical structures and, and horizontalize them so that um, the frontline car worker felt comfortable um, stopping the assembly line and bringing the supervisor or telling the CEO that, well, you know, it doesn't make sense to do it this way. Uh, there's a better way to do it based on my knowledge from the front line. And so, um, you know, it gets this issue of like, well, how do we involve patients and communities in the solutions? You know, uh, is it by doing a focus group with them? Is it to have them part of a formal team working on the problem? Um, give them an equal vote, having a community advisory board. I mean, each of these processes is different, you know? And I think if you think about it, um, the ones which are more likely to really address the root cause and uh, start prioritizing um, um, patient outcomes and inequities more so than others are ones where the patients communities have a stronger seat at the table. You know, uh, it's just the way organizations work and not unique to University of Chicago, but it's just the way organizations work. I you know, think you're John Rawls here. Um, um, so um, I'd add that too, you know, so, so, and that gets back to the question of like, why we can't just do the technical part, we have to do the cultural equity part and the thinking about how do we do the cultural equity part. So it really is sort of all intertwined. Still, it truly is um, a priority of the institution. There's only so much that will be done. Marshall, could, could I ask a question that you, you spoke a little bit about, but I, I, I'd love to hear a bit more about it. And that is how this new project of yours, 
that, that you've been thinking about and writing about and practicing. Uh, that is the improv and, and stand-up comedy uh, as part of the interactions between um, clinicians and patients, how, how that contributes, uh, how that contributes to reducing disparities and overcoming a degree of racism. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you asked that, Mark. So I was actually thinking about this morning and, you know, it reminded me, I need to do a shout out to you in the McLean Center in that, you know, if you think about all that I've talked about today, and, and as Monica said, this is a pretty ambitious talk covering a lot of different things. I thought about this morning, I said, you know, this really is the, the marching order of the McLean Center and that the, 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 maybe the key innovation you made, Mark, was that you were able to take sort of abstract ethics and philosophical thought and made it relevant to the front line, you know, that front line clinician patient relationship discussion, shared decision making. So you're integrating abstract principles with practical reality. And so the answer to your question about like, you know, where does something like the arts and improv and stand up come in? I, I'm hoping this is a way to cut through, you know, all the abstraction, all of the system structural talk, all the talk about rules and regulations and policies to how do you reach individuals? Because we know that in terms of all this to occur, for the change to occur, for the policies to change, for organizations to change, for the direct patient care to change, people have to buy into it and care about it. And so where improv and stand-up uh, fits in, and again, sort of harkening back to uh, my improv partners and like uh, and moment for stand-up and all, the heart of, I think, those forms, as well as arts in general, is they, they draw upon the human experience, you know? And, and I think like um, what we're trying to do with these exercises is what I think a good artist does of trying to draw from their own personal life experience. I mean, that's why, you know, like, you know, a more seasoned clinician, you know, usually over time we get better, right? And part of it is because we have more life experience. Similarly, um, it's interesting, like um, when I look at improvisational folks who do improv, sometimes the older folks, they can drive upon more life experiences. Uh, and so um, there's this richness to that. And so I think what we're hoping to do with like the arts is that we're trying to expose people to a broader set of lived experiences. And so I think that's the power, like when we did it with the medical students, they would hear through the exercises, the lived experience of their classmates. So it's not an abstraction talking about racism or an abstraction talking about structural inequity. They hear the concrete stories of their classmates uh, and how these inequities have affected real people and their real classmates. So if, and one thing we haven't talked about is establishing a safe space. So Monica Vela in particular has taught me like, uh, you know, the importance of establishing a safe space. If you can do that and you can make it personal, um, we can get go pretty far. So that's what I'm hoping that um, the arts can do. And which again, I think you think about like the McLean Center, I think that is one of your major contributions, Mark. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marsha. Um, I'll just note that we have a comment um, from Connie Erlwerk, who just wants us to remember that we have uh, nurses that are a key part of the healthcare profession. Um, they're at the bedside, particularly seeing our COVID-19 patients um, and that they're also facing their own inequities in healthcare um, organizations and how they're perceived and treated. And just to make sure that we're conscious of that. Yeah, thank you for those comments, Connie. Um, I've tried to gear my talk to be um, basically, you know, uh, word it in a way that applies to uh, any type of clinician and non-clinician involvement in this particular sphere. And I, I, Mark mentioned, I, I've been really fortunate to, to be on this National Health Medicine Future Nursing Committee and have met some tremendous folks. And nursing, nursing is incredible, has incredible power, potential power to um, advance health equity. And in fact, the NAM report is gonna focus upon uh, nursing's role for addressing social terms of health and advancing health equity. And we're hoping that, that this will help nursing uh, be that we are, for example, like um, uh, advocating for it in the National Academy of Medicine report. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Marshall, for a very insightful and thought-provoking uh, lecture.
Um, and we look forward to next week's talk. Um, and thank you all again for um, joining, uh, joining us for today. Uh, Mark, do you have any last, last comments? Sending no, us only to thank you, Monica, uh, for your lovely uh, supervision uh, of the program and, and the questions. And of course, to, to give my deepest thanks to Marshall for, for an extraordinary talk, uh, not, not to mention extraordinary career achievements. Um, well, well, thanks very much, Mark. And I'm going to give people something to look forward to that, like, um, Mark is really uh, a, a, a gamer. And so, like, um, when the Revival Theater opens up, our, our troupe, we have, like, a monthly show, which involves highlighting a University of Chicago faculty member. So uh, whenever it's the first July that opens up where we have a new fellows coming in, guess who the faculty guests will be at this improv show? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Siegler. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful yeah. Wednesday afternoon. Yeah, everybody, next week, uh, Doug White from Pittsburgh will, will be um, joining us. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Monica Marshall. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Bye. Bye.